Yeah, hello. Hello, hi. Hey. So, bear with me. I did a talk last year at EMW and I was a bit nervous and I talked too quickly. Someone heckled me from the back, so back people, please feel free to do that if I talk too quickly. Um, so this is a kind of a story combined with a little bit of an explanation about a project that I'm going to be to install tomorrow. So it's kind of a little bit how I like to make some lessons learned, things like that. So I'm going to start with how I kind of got, got there. So um, when I was at school, I was uh, really interested in electronics. I don't really know quite how I got into that. I used to, this is a primary school, I used to go to an adult evening class and do an electronics course. It was really basic. My dyslexia didn't really help, so I don't know how much I really learned, but it was enough to kind of, to, to have people my age that were interested in something. Um, I guess it was a forerunner to hack spaces and things we have now. Um, and then, then I didn't really take that forward, so I, I wasn't you know, hugely successful at school um, in scientific areas and things like that. So I was more creative, more design based. So when I went to college, I studied graphic design. And then again at university, I studied something that was kind of hybrid, graphic design and media, which was because I was kind of thinking I might, I might study, I might want to become a web designer, which turned out to be, for me anyway, the most uninteresting thing ever. Um, but um, whilst I was there, I started experimenting and going back to this kind of idea of, of playing around with electronic stuff. Um, I discovered Instructables.com and I started looking up how to do stuff. This was really before Arduino was really kind of kicking off and so it wasn't immediately obvious which microcontroller I should use. So I, by coincidence, used a, an Apple chip, but a simple one, an 80 tiny chip. And I made a, a little traffic light controller using some instructions and then reposted that. And that kind of gave me the kick, I guess, to really want to keep doing this again and again. Um, and so about a year later, I took part in a beginner's Arduino workshop. Um, this is 2008, if I looked at it. And around the same time, I went to the Museum of Modern Art in New York, and that's where I kind of, these things started to, the, the, the roots of the story that I'm going to tell you come from. So, since then, I've graduated, done a master's, and all along I've been doing things that I should be doing, but also doing these other kind of distractions, if you like. Um, one of the things I saw at the Museum of Modern Art was uh, one of these old-fashioned departure boards that you see at an airport or a train station. And there was something about it that kind of really latched on for me, and I wanted to make one. So I asked the company that made them, that I researched and found out, how much it would cost to make 140 of them perhaps for a Twitter display, and they, they said about 40,000 euros for this particular one, uh, plus that. <laughs> so that was, um, yeah, that wasn't going to happen. But you can kind of see that, that blurry picture the guy just took on his way to responding my email was um, was enough to kind of sort of set something in motion in my head that I wanted to do. And kind of crazy, this was in my final year at university. Um, I decided to try and make the whole thing myself, which was ludicrous. I had no idea how I was going to do it, but I guess and I, being naive about how complicated this problem was going to be, I actually decided that I could achieve it. And well, I achieved one. <laughs> uh, one that did really work, as you can see, that's the servo motor on the side. And anyone that uh, knows electronics will know that that's not likely to really work. Um, it had been hacked for continuous rotation, and if you start to think about it, you could never fit enough letters side by side. And probably an Arduino glue on the top of glue tap isn't the best way forwards. But it introduced me to some ideas. Um, I'd never knew what a laser cutter was, and to this day, I think that's probably the most useful tool that a maker can have. 3D printers don't even compare to the laser cutter, at least for me. Um, so this was the original design. And looking back at it now, I think it's kind of, again, shows kind of a willing and a, a naive curiosity into how I can make things. But uh, I don't know, it just seems kind of stupid now. It was made with five mil thick pieces of perspex which I thought would be too thin and turned out to be uh, way too thick. Um, and then it was made with these kind of, kind of 
I looked around at what other flip displays used. Um, you know, you see those flip flops on eBay, they're super cheap. I kind of just destroyed one of those and, and uh, anyway. So these are the kind of parts that I've designed and cut out. Um, and this was the kind of 3D model I made of it. And you can see it's sort of, sort of super bodged. But I photographed it in a kind of nice way, so that kind of, I hope you get through my degree at least. Uh, yeah, so this was, I say, when I kind of discovered the laser cutter. And this was a kind of a real turning point because it meant I could turn ideas into reality without having to learn complicated or seemingly complicated and hard to access tools like band saws and, and things like that that kind of was a little bit afraid of. I could design something in a software package like Illustrator, which is what I was used to, and uh, have it made in a, a few minutes. Um, and in, interestingly, this, this seems to be an approach that other people have taken as well. Um, if anyone saw Ben Hecht's talk, he was a graphic artist and uses his uh, CNC and his laser cutter regularly in his show doing the same thing, using Illustrator to design this. Uh, so I had a pile of parts, kind of glued them together. You can see it's not even straight. <laughs> it didn't work very well. It fell apart a few times. Um, but then version 2 came along. I had an exhibition, so I made another one. Um, this time using thinner plastic, see-through, so I could actually see into it because it's a prototype. Why would you make it a finished version? I had more time, and I realised that having a motor bolted on the outside was not going to work, so I put it inside, which introduced me to the idea of having some gears. And again, not being an expert on that either, I um, I got. If anyone wants to use the Adobe Illustrator, you'll know there's a star tool. You can tell it how many points you want. So I did that, and then I kind of used some circles to kind of cut the sharp bits off. Um, apparently that's not how you make gears, because uh, <laughs> it, it didn't really work. Um, and also there's this thing in the laser cutter called Kerf, which I've never heard of either. Apparently the plastic that you cut isn't exactly the same size as the thing that it was cut out of anymore. So, yeah, and super glue is not a really good plastic uh, glue either. As you can see, it kind of frosted all the plastic, which is an interesting effect. And also it's not a very good way of sticking metal to plastic either, but you know, that seemed like the most logical approach from what my uh, upbringing was, because I had not experienced any of these other tools, so you learn quickly when you make stuff, I guess. So it was a little exhibition, and by the time of the exhibition, I didn't have a picture of what it looked like at the end, I guess I wasn't that happy because it completely destroyed itself after a week of uh, sort of rotating one, one unit. So this is some of the stuff I do in Illustrator for just getting measurements, understanding it in my head. And at this time I was just doing it all in 2D, but later you can see here this third version, this is the kind of quite close to what it's like now. Um, I started using SketchUp to take those flat pieces, extrude them three millimeters and assemble them in virtual space to see if they actually connect together. So this was a more recent one. And so to connect those gears, I, 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 there's a, a chap called Matthias Wendel, who um, he's a Canadian chap who does a lot of woodwork. He has created a piece of software that actually creates proper gears. And so if you're ever looking to make some laser cut gears, I think there's something built into Inkscape or his, his little package is dollars So this is using some proper gears and um, an aluminium mounting hub to give it a really good strong fix to the motor. So that was something I learned. I also learned that Kind of the way this whole thing works is you've got two circular discs uh, which rotate on an axle, um, a set amount to kind of flip forward so many units, and we'll see that right at the end. Um, that they would sort of twist in different ways to each other, so they would kind of fall out because of this, because they're not kept completely parallel at all times. So I designed this um, this kind of unit that would uh, hold them exactly the, the correct distance and prevent them twisting. Um, so this is the most recent version. So throughout this, I've been blogging quite a lot on my own blog um, about what uh, what other people have done in the past. A lot of people have found, especially in Europe, old units and taken them apart and uh, tried to figure out how to re reverse engineer them. So I've been blogging a lot. So I've kind of my blog's become one of the main things you go to if you search online for split flap displays or something of this type. So it's kind of an archive of what I've been doing, but what other people have. And as a result, um, people email me a couple of times a week sometimes, 
uh, asking, where can I buy these? Can you make one for me? Da -da 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 -da. So I kind of cornered the market on, <laughs> on uh, homebrew split flap departure boards, <laughs> um, if that's the thing. Uh, yeah, so the company um, came to me about two months ago, as they regularly do, saying, can you make this? And it turned out for, the, for a change they were based in London, which is where I am. So I was actually able to go and meet them and have a chat. And I'd been intending to work on the project a bit over the summer, so I thought this would be a good opportunity to actually see if it went anywhere, because in the past it's never really has. But uh, it did, and so this Sunday I'm going to be leaving here early, unfortunately, to go do some work um, to put 10 of these into a shop window on Regent Street for the uh, Royal Institute, Institution of British Architects Windows. It's a kind of an annual event where they commission architects to create shop windows and they commissioned me in turn to build these. So this is just some fancy renders that we did for the client. If anyone's interested in how this actually works, I'll explain, but when I've done the talk in the past on my, on my own, it's always run over, so I don't want to spend too much time. I do want to talk a little bit about how it works on this, though. I kind of broke things down into modules. So there was the hardware side, the mechanical side you see here, and then there was the kind of electronics and the software, and so I was kind of working on these all in parallel, and so the hardest challenge was the hardware, because it's what I'm least used to, and kind of coming from that web design background, I had a big grasp of the programming, but the electronics has also been a challenge. And I think I made a really smart decision in trying to break it down. This is a really old drawing I did um, quite early on, where I had this idea of having, essentially, a microcontroller on every single unit, rather than having to control, as the old-fashioned ones would have done, maybe a whole row of 15 or 20 at a time, um, which keeps the kind of complexity of the code quite simple. So you've got a, a serial communication that's just spurting out all the words that you want to display on the screen. It receives those and, and processes that, tells the motor to move so many steps from where it was previously, and hope that it doesn't miss any. Um, and that's why they were so inaccurate, because uh, there's not a great deal of feedback. They, the ones that I've built recently, they don't have any feedback either, but more modern devices would have had a, a kind of home position, if you like. And then you can see here, like, there's some kind of main controller to the side, and then three of the modules, for example. And to kind of do that communication, I discovered this thing called RS-485, which is, if you're interested, uh, a way of talking to multiple devices at the same time on the same bus. So it's just kind of like serial port on your Arduino, but multiple devices can listen in, and it uses um, something called differential pair communication. So basically, it's more resistant to noise, so you can use it at longer distances. And I built a little circuit board, populated it, and tested it, and it worked the first time, which I was super chuffed about. And so, in this process, I kind of learned quite a lot of things, and one of them is obviously to press that early, iterate often, give things a little while, come back to them later, because you sometimes miss mistakes, and to break them into smaller challenges. And this is the one that I kind of tell the students at the university that I work at quite often, um, which is moving in any direction is better than standing still. We often find students, especially in their final year, will sit there for weeks and weeks on end saying that they're doing something, but really what they're doing is sort of, it's a sort of procrastination, but it's, it's not, it's a kind of a lack of confidence perhaps to, to go in, in a direction. If it doesn't work, then change direction. So if you kind of can bear with this analogy, if you're lost in the desert and you don't know where you are, you've got no devices, and all you can see is dunes around you, then the best way in this kind of analogy to find your way home is, is to start climbing one of those. And then if it's the wrong, wrong way, then you go back up the other side and figure out your, kind of, your way home. And that's, that's kind of one of the key things I've found. And then <laughs> with the RS485, as you see here, I was having some real trouble. And I thought, I blamed myself, I thought I'd made something wrong. I checked it and checked it and checked it. And then it wasn't until I spent some money on a oscilloscope that I realised there was a problem. So I didn't have an hack space, so I didn't have access to one. So if you're ever doing the electronics, I would really recommend buying one of these. You can get them pretty cheap, £40 uh, for a reasonable one. Um, so that's kind of the end of my ramble, but I just wanted to, 
to show you what it is I'm doing or what I've done. So this is ten of them in a row. Now, you can kind of imagine this is a shop front with a window on one side and the other and a doorway between. So um, there's five on each. This is just a message we sent to to uh, one of our colleagues that was on holiday at the time. Um, but it's a nice little demonstration of, of it in action. Um, there's no sound on this, but it's Because there's a lot of ice. It's a little bit tedious. Is it working? It wasn't enough characters, obviously. Um, enjoy your.
Um, yes, I looked. Um, I had an option for some from New York, but the cost, they didn't really want any money for them, but uh, shipping them, they're very heavy, even just for one of them, um, wasn't really worth it. And they sent me a bunch of photos, so I kind of got what I needed to. And um, most of the ones you'll find just display destinations, they don't display letters, um, they're quite long ones. Uh, so unless it was displaying a destination or somewhere near your home, you probably wouldn't have much interest in the I wouldn't. Um, and I think we can keep these ones after anyway, so. Uh, the other part of the question was, uh, do you not find a signal second motor for each letter pretty expensive? Yeah, they are expensive. Um, you could use a DC motor, I've looked at this, some of them do use DC motors, some of them use solar motors and a ratchet mechanism. Um, it is expensive, but I mean, these cost about £200 each to make, and that's just because of the inefficiencies of making it in the way it is made. It's made on a laser cutter with plastic. That's, all these things are quite expensive parts. £10 a bill of materials, it's 200 is massive. Those stepper motors are about £10 each. So, yes, yeah, it's expensive, but there's other ways of doing it. Okay, you've got more questions here? Hey, Brian. More than half already, Tom. Um, I'll do your laser cutting for free. Thank you. Uh, just the cost of the materials. Yes. It's a good project. Thank you. Mark, another question? Do you have any other obsessions? <laughs> oh, um, it's not an obsession of mine, it was a project I did, um, which is what my talk at EMW was about which was an open source vacuum cleaner. I won't really go into that now, because it's quite another long talk, but um, <laughs> uh, yeah, I, mean, I kind of like to focus on, on projects. I think the Maker Fair and the Maker Space might be a bit much for now, so probably won't take on another thing this big for a while. But, um, sorry? Yes, you will. Yes, I will. Probably. Yeah, I'll try not to. Um, but yeah, no, not really any others. I spent this much, this is the longest project I've ever worked on. I mean, I'm, I'm only 26, but um, five years spent on this project is, is quite a long time. More questions? Anyone? That looks like, oh no, I've got one more. Do you want each other to bring one along? Unfortunately not. They're pretty fragile and um, they're actually going into this installation, as I say, tomorrow evening, so I didn't want to damage it just beforehand. But, um, yeah, if you're in London for the whole of September, they're going to be in a shop in those shops, um, Jack Spade, um, so it's in Regent Street, London, so if you want to, you can go down there, um, and maybe if I do another talk at some point, I'll try and remember to bring one along. Sorry about that. We've got lots of questions coming. Any, any more? Oh, no? Oh, no, yeah, we have a couple more. So what might the controller did you end up using on that 45 first control each of the individual boxes? Sure, yeah, so when I was prototyping it, um, I used an Arduino. Um, and it's still running an Arduino uh, bootloaded at my 3 to 8, but instead I'm using, um, I can't remember the website, there's this like hobby components they do, they basically import all the stuff from Kilo Extreme, so I've got some kind of knockoff um, Arduino Pro Minis, Sparkfun Pro Minis. Um, and I made a custom PCB that goes on the back that you just plug that in and a knockoff easy driver <laughs> as well. And so that's what's kept the price down, otherwise you'd be looking at maybe 250 for the whole thing instead of 200. Right, I'll ask you a quiet again. Going, going. Right, no more questions. So thank you very much, Tom Lynch. <laughs>